is sad, <coughs> I think, <coughs> that we that we remember in so many cases <coughs> just the one <coughs> negative thing about a Bible character, for that matter, about any person. And so many good things, no doubt, that he did are completely overshadowed by the mistake, one mistake, that he made. We think of such people as Benedict Arnold. <coughs> we think of such people as Aaron Burr, Rahab the harlot. The characters in history, <coughs> especially in Bible history, <coughs> that that were had their entire lives overshadowed because of one mistake. And we identify them with that mistake. You never think about Rahab, the good woman. You never think about Rahab, the woman who saved the spies from death when they came to Jericho. You never think about Rahab, the woman who won her own family to Jesus or to Jehovah God, or to God's salvation through the coming Messiah. You never think about Rahab, the woman who was listed in the Bible as one of the few women listed in the genealogy of Jesus. You never think about Rahab, who was listed in the great hall of fame of heroes in Hebrews chapter 11. It's always sad to say, Rahab the harlot. If I mention the name John Mark, the first thing you think about is he left the first missionary journey, went home, turned back. John Mark is not mentioned a great deal as the author of the second book of the New Testament. And the truth is, John Mark became one of Paul's most faithful, loyal members of his missionary journey journeys in Paul's middle and latter years. We don't think about it. I might mention the name Bathsheba. <laughs> Immediately, a red flag would fly up. The truth is, Bathsheba became one of the finest mothers in all of the Bible. But that one, maybe it was a mistake. Maybe David forced her to do what she did. I do not know. But if it, were, it was a mistake, <laughs> the truth is, uh, she has been labeled as a fallen woman. The same is true of Delilah. Rahab, these people in the Bible who committed one tragic deed or made one sad mistake and who are left. She obeys her mom. She obeys her dad. She uh, studies hard, makes good grades in school. And then one night, as a teenage young lady, she yields herself to the tempter. She commits fornication and she gets pregnant. She has a baby. And she's known from then on by those who know her by that. Now, I'm not sure that's the way it ought to be, but like it or not, that's the way it is. And that's why you've got to be on guard all the time. That's why you can't let the guard down at all. That's why you've got to heed 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 52 weeks a year, every year of your life. <laughs> the statement, flee youthful lust. If I say to you the name Richard Nixon, immediately you think of one word, Watergate. Watergate. And the truth is, Mr. Nixon did as much in this country to fight communism in the early days of his public service as any other man in America. And the truth is, Richard Nixon has done enough good for this nation for him not to have to suffer the stigma of one word called Watergate the rest of his life and to have his, his name in history completely shattered, overshadowed by a cloud called Watergate. I wish it weren't that way. But man is so constructed that we magnify the one evil over the 10,000 merits. We magnify the one mistake over the 10,000 good things. And that's why that we have to be careful all the time. Just one night in sin. Just one bad uh, accident. Just one night uh, in the hands or arms of the tempter. Just one night in the nightclub. And before you know it, Everything is gone. Everything is ruined. Future ruined. Past blighted. <coughs> present unhappy. Reputation no good. Why? Because of one mistake. 
On his second missionary journey, the Apostle Paul went to a place called Thessalonica. There he founded a church. This church was characterized by its tremendous love for the prophetic scriptures. They loved to teach and, and learn about the second coming of Jesus Christ. While in Thessalonica, Paul had a convert. He was a young man whose name was Demas. Now, if Demas had not done one thing, if, this, if it were not for one little incident in his life, we'd have boys all this room tonight named Demas. All this room. Nobody is named Demas, unless it's a hound dog. Nobody is named Demas. Uh, you may have a cat named Demas, or a dog named Demas, or a mule named Demas, but uh, I don't know any boy named Demas, and if your name is Demas, I'm sorry, I don't mean to <coughs> cast reflection on your name, because it's a perfectly good name. But this guy was a good guy. He, he was saved, and then he was called to preach. He became a pride and joy of the Apostle Paul. Paul marked him right along beside Timothy and Titus and Luke and John Mark and others who were his preacher boys. Now, you understand this, unless you're a pastor. <laughs> but a pastor has a certain affinity and love for his preacher boys that is not greater than that of love our young people, but it's different than that. I never walk in this pulpit, never, <laughs> on a Sunday morning or Sunday night without praying for my preacher boys across the country and around the world. I prayed tonight from Japan to South America and uh, all across this country for my preacher boys. I've already done that twice today, asking God to bless them and give them power as they preach. Ah, oh, there's something, a tie between the pastor and his preacher boys. Well, Demas was, uh, he was one of Paul's preacher boys, and he accompanied Paul on some of his journeys. Are you listening? He accompanied Paul on some of his journeys. When Paul, for example, wrote the book of Colossians from prison in uh, Rome. He was in jail. Uh, he sent greetings to the people in Colossae from Demas. said, Demas sends his greetings. Or Demas says, hi. When Paul wrote Philemon, uh, that letter that was taken by Onesimus the slave, uh, Paul said to Philemon, uh, Demas says hi. So there, those years that Paul was in prison, Demas was there. He no doubt was faithful. He stood beside Paul. He was loyal to Paul. He traveled with Paul. He suffered with Paul. He slept beneath the stars with Paul. He did without with Paul. He was beaten with Paul. He was stoned with Paul. This is a good guy. Nothing bad about Demas so far. He's a good guy. He is a faithful, loyal preacher boy who suffers with his preacher and, and is loyal to his preacher and fights with his preacher and is stoned with his preacher and is hated with his preacher and, is, and gets criticism because he stands beside the Apostle Paul. Here he is with Paul in Rome while Paul's in jail. He and Mark and Luke seem, and Timothy seem to be the closest young men or men to the Apostle Paul. Now, folks, for years he was faithful. Demas was no fly by night. He didn't come and uh, get saved one night and come to church like some folks do it. Yip, yip, hooray, 15 for team, rah, 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 and then all of a sudden he's gone. No, no, Demas was faithful. For weeks he was faithful. And weeks became months, and months became years, and years became many. And Demas was faithful and loyal. Now then, it is evident that Paul must die. It is evident that Paul will be martyred and the sharp sword of the guillotine will sever his head from his body and death is inevitable. Demas begins to think. He says, man, alive. The old man's about gone. I've got some years left in me. Now, for Paul to die, he's an aged man, but I'm not old like Paul. I mean, good night. He's going to die soon anyway. But uh, but here I am. I am. Uh, I'm. Uh, and and Demas <coughs> connived and conceived the plan. By the way, let me ask you a question. What are you folks going to do when the sword puts you in act like it was to Paul? I'm talking about you folks that don't even tithe. <coughs> what are you going to do when you got to die for Jesus? You folks that won't even come to church on Wednesday night. <coughs> What are you going to do? You folks that stay home and watch the box on Wednesday night while the Word of God is being taught. I mean, that's how much you love God. What are you going to do when the sword's at your throat? 
I mean, they say, who do you belong to? Who do you belong? You belong to Jesus? Or you remember the First Baptist Church? Are you one of those soul winners? Okay. They can't. Deny your faith. Off comes your head. Oh, you'll stay for the house. I, I die for my Lord. Not if you won't tithe for your Lord. You folks that won't get 10% of your income to God, don't you think you're going to die for Him? And Demas begins to think. He says, uh, my soul, my Paul's going to die, and they'll get me too. And so Demas comes up with a plan. Here was his plan. Demas came to Paul and said, Paul, I've just heard from Thessalonica, and they have an emergency there, and I feel led to go home because they need me at home. Now, the truth is, he hadn't heard from them. And the truth is, he didn't have to go home. He pretended that he heard from home and that there was an emergency there. And he said, there's an urgency. I've got to leave. And to save his neck, he turned his back on the apostle and, and went home because he said, God led me home. Boy, it's an unbelievable thing that God gets blamed for. I mean, I mean, uh, yeah, she's not saved and, and, uh, and uh, she smokes cigarettes, but... Uh, uh, the Lord is leading me to marry her. Of course, he's not saved, and he, and he drinks liquor, but uh, the Lord is leading me to do it. Of course, I'm 18 and she's 16, but God is leading us to marry. Of course, I came to get an education, and I'm going to go home after a year and a half, or two and a half years, but God is leading me home. Now look, I'd have more respect for you if you just say, I'm a chicken, i got a yellow spine, I'm a yellow liver, yellow liver coward, and I just want to go home. I'm homesick. I don't love God anymore. I don't like the Bible. I don't care what God's will is. I'd have more respect for you if you could say that than for you to bring God into your backslidden condition. Yeah, God leads me to. God, God is leading me to go to this heathen school where I'll become a heathen too. God is leading me. No, God's not doing any such thing. Don't you blame God. Listen, God never leads contrary to the commands of this book. <laughs> and this book says, Come ye out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And this book says, Touch not the unclean thing. And this book says, You're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people. And this book says, We're not to be yoked up with unbelievers. And the, the, the Lord God and the Spirit of God never lead contrary to what God says in this book. So Demas comes and says, Now, Paul, God is, is leading me home. He's leading me to go to Thessalonica and uh, go home. Now, the truth is, he was scared. Now, wait a minute, folks. Wait a minute. I heard a fellow say the other night, the other day's preaching, and a good man had a hole in his head, but he was a good man. And I don't mean the whole state. He just was there for a while. Uh, but he said, Paul was fearless. Now, nobody is fearless uh, except an idiot. There's no merit in standing for God if you're, if you're fearless. Somebody said, boy, old house. <laughs> Hadn't thought of this in years. One day I was out soul winning and I, <coughs> my car was being worked on and I had to get a cab <coughs> to come back home. I started off walking toward the north side <coughs> and witnessing and I got over here on the north side <coughs> and my car was over here at this Miles Maywood Garage <coughs> down here on, May, on uh, May Street, used to be there, corner of May and Columbia. <coughs> and so I, uh, I was too far to walk and I, I got me a cab, called a cab over here on Northside, called from this Hertz rent a car place, called a cab. So, <coughs> cab drove up, and it's the only time I guess, oh, in years I've been in a taxi cab. So, uh, in, in this area. <coughs> and so, I got in the cab, there's a lady driver. And I guess lady, the female. And uh, so I, <coughs> I said, how's the cab business? Uh, she said, all right, pretty good. I said, you ever get scared being a lady driver? And she said, oh, I said, not much. I said, one time, a man killed a fella and came and escaped, and I was driving the murderer. I didn't know that. That scared me a little bit. scared me to think about it, too. And uh, she said, uh, but uh, that's about all. And I said, well, where do you go to church? She hadn't seen me. She, I was in the back seat, and she was in the front. And she said, down to that big church on Sibley, big Baptist church on Sibley. Well, I go down that big Baptist church on Sibley, too. And so I, I asked her, I said, well, I said, who's the preacher down there? She said, a guy named Hyam. I, I said, Lord, help me. <laughs> and I said, uh, 
What kind of guy is Hiles like, is he? She said, peculiar. The Lord didn't help me. I said, peculiar. I said, I've heard an awful lot about him. And uh, you think he's peculiar? Yeah, he's very peculiar. Very peculiar. Strangest guy you ever saw in your life. But she said, <laughs> I'll tell you one thing. He ain't scared nobody. She said, that man, he preached it like it is. <laughs> he ain't scared of nobody. She didn't know I was scared to death of her right then. I did. <laughs> she drove me down to the miles, maybe with the garage. <laughs> the bill was old, dollar sixty-five or so. <laughs> and uh, I gave her a five-dollar bill, said, keep the change. I said, before I go, I want to introduce myself to you. I said, uh, I was in the back seat. I said, my name is Jack Hiles. You mean, you mean, you mean, you mean, you, you, I said, yeah, that's what I mean. She put her, her head in her hands like this and <coughs> put her, el her, her elbows on the steering wheel <coughs> and they're going to shake her head. How long she stayed there, I don't know. I do know. I went in and got my car <coughs> and had to pay for it. And you had a long take to get a car, check that, get a new seat. I went, drove down here to the shopping center where the Zayers is on 165th, there where the McDonald's is, and uh, <coughs> bought something there. And uh, came back, it must have been 15, 20 minutes, and she still had her elbows on the steering wheel and her hand in her head, sh shaking her head, <coughs> head in her hand, shaking her head like that. Now, <laughs> what I'm saying is this. She said, that house fella, he ain't afraid of nobody. Uh, a fellow's not afraid, not, doesn't have courage. Uh, your degree of courage <laughs> is determined or, by, by your degree of fear. Old Dr. Bill Rice used to say, <coughs> he said, oh, pe people preach about Daniel. Old Daniel said, I'll be glad to go in the lion's den, old Rusty. I'll be glad to go in the lion's den, neighbor. <laughs> he said, I'll be glad to. Boy, oh boy. Old, old Daniel walked in the lion's den and said, come here, Leo. Let you and I just sort of hug a little bit, you know. Oh, boy, I'll tell you, thank God. God's going to deliver me. Old Dr. Bill said, that's not the way it is. It? <laughs> he said, um, when the king said, if you keep praying, you're going to be casting the lion's den. Beads of sweat popped out on Daniel. He said, man, are you sure, 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 sure? And when they dropped old Daniel down the lion's den, he held his nose <laughs> and closed his eyes and said, boy, here goes, here goes. And he got out there and he, and he said, okay, I'm ready. Go ahead and eat me, fellas. Eat. Go ahead and eat. Well, I was glad. <laughs> they didn't. Uh, the truth is, uh, Daniel, uh, you said, how you know Daniel was scared? Because I'd have been scared. And you would too. And Demas got, and there's nothing wrong with being scared. Listen, there's nothing wrong with being afraid. What's wrong is, is not doing right, even though it's hard to do. You're supposed to do right if it's hard. You're supposed to do right to get criticized. You're supposed to do right to get slandered. You're supposed to do right to get beaten. You're supposed to do right to get killed. And we need some people today who will say, I'll do right. It doesn't matter what the world says. It doesn't matter how much they laugh. It doesn't matter. You say, oh, the house, but it hurts my feelings. Folks criticize me. hurts mine too. For the house, I don't like it when folks uh, uh, don't like me. I don't either. But for the house, I have a hard time sleeping at night when folks curse me. I do too. But bless your little pea picking heart, it doesn't matter what the result is. God calls His people to do right. Demas, Demas said, Paul, I want to go home. They need me there. Now, I would have had more respect for Demas if he walked up and said, Paul, I'm scared to death and I'm, I'm not going to die. I'm just not going to do it, Paul. I'm scared. But he hides behind that little God leads me bit. <laughs> that little they need me at home bit. I hear it till I want to vomit. College students come through my office door like an army. Saying, I, I, I think I ought to go back home. I think I ought to quit. I, 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 I feel led to do it. Oh, boy. You're joining, joining that crowd of John Marks. And Dima says, but you say for the house, it's hard. Nobody ever said the Christian life was going to be easy. But you say, I get lonely. Paul got lonely in jail too in Rome. But you say, I have to do without. God's people are supposed to do without if they have to do right. Do right, whatever the cost. Do right. Old Dr. Bob Jones used to put his cup, his hand around his mouth like that. And you guys went to Bob Jones when he was alive. Used to hear him say, do right. Do right. Do right if the sun doesn't shine. Do right. Do right. Do right if the moon turns to blood. Do right. 
Do right! Do right if the stars fall. Do right! But you say for the house, I have a, I'm over sex. Do right! But you say for the house, I love to touch her. Do right! But you say for the house, I, I just enjoy that necking and petting. Do right! But you say for the house, I need that extra money. Do right! Do right if the stars fall. Do right if the sun turns to blood. Do right if the moon becomes black as a sackcloth of hair like midnight. Do right. Do right at work, men. Do right at school, young people. Do right on the football field. Athletes, do right when the examination is taken. Students, do right. Lady, when you're home while they're watching the television set, do right. Man, when you're on the job, do right. Soldier in the, the base, do right. Sailor out at the naval base, do right. Christian, do right. But you say it's not easy. I didn't say it was easy. And God didn't call you to a Sunday school picnic. God called you to battle. And you're supposed to do right. 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 But the Lord is leading me. Shush. The Lord is leading me. Little Demas <laughs> turns, leaves the aged Paul in that little Mamertine prison I told you about, damp and seeping, cold. The Bible says he forsook him. Paul said, <coughs> Demas, hath forsaking me, <coughs> saking me, having loved this present world. <coughs> well, think about that. Demas didn't say. Paul didn't say. Demas hath forsaken me because of a problem in Thessalonica. Paul could see through it and so can I. Somebody comes to our church <coughs> and some gal wants to pour herself in a pair of breeches and wear her bathing suit and her halter and her shorts while she works in the yard and wants to... Wants to to uh, watch the <laughs> soap operas on television and then wants to uh, curl her finger around a Lucky Strike or a Pell Mell or a Winston because Winston tastes good like a da -da 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 cigarette should. Winston will send you to hell like all the rest of them too. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> and so she says, the Lord is leading me to another church. Now, honey, why don't you just go ahead and say you're too worried to take the preaching here? Why don't you admit it? I'd have more respect for you. Will you choose some little church with a mama called Papa Fed, denominational led, deacon board bred, little preacherette and, and who preaches sermon, preacherette who preaches sermonettes to Christianettes after the sextets and octets and while folks smoke cigarettes and, and, uh, you go there and join because the Lord led me. The Lord didn't lead you. Your worldly life led you. You say, preacher, if you don't quit preaching like that, I'm going to get me a church that I, where I like it. I just don't like it here anymore. Okay, trot your little backslidden carcass off and set yourself down in front of some little nambat, pambay, pussyfoot, near tickling, back scratching, penny pinching, nickel nipping, soft soaping, and peak eliminate preacher. Go ahead and do it. But I want you to title, I want you to know this that you're not fooling God and you're not fooling me and you're not even fooling yourself. You know you're hiding behind the will of God when it's nothing more than you want to live in the world more than you're living in the world now. I don't like it. I don't like your living either. Oh, God, give us some Christian people who'll do right. Paul said, Demas <laughs> hath forsaken me, <laughs> having loved this present world. And when Paul said that, Demas didn't know that's going to be read 2,000 years later in America. He didn't know <laughs> that was holy writ. If Demas had known it, <laughs> if Paul had said, now, Demas, I'm writing the Bible here. <laughs> and I'm about to write, I'm going to write down what you're going to do. And millions and millions and billions of people are going to read this from now on. Demas would say, I'll stand and I die. A heap of people, <coughs> a heap of people are turning their back on the truth of God in this generation. A heap of them. Famous preacher for the dozens. Heard a famous preacher of the day say, I changed my opinion about some things. He said, I... I, years ago, I wouldn't have gone to to to, to, to meet fellowship with the Pope, but I did. And he said, I've changed my mind about different forms of government. He said, communist governments are not as bad as I thought they were. 
You've been running the wrong crowd. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wrong crowd. You say, who is it? Doesn't matter who it is. It's wrong for anybody to be like that. Preachers changing and churches changing and schools changing. There are schools that 25 years ago were citadels for the faith and separation and the truth that now bowed their knees to bail and dipped their sails for the unholy dollar and the popularity. I'll guarantee you one thing. I'd rather have 200 students at Hiles Anderson College and stand for the truth and have 20,000 students and dip our sails to what's right. Paul said, He must have forsaken me, <coughs> having loved this present world. I don't think Paul, when he picked up his pen, I don't think Paul said, He must have forsaken me. I think Paul said, <coughs> He must have forsaken me, having loved this present world. I only saw John Rice weep one time out of the pulpit. I've seen him weep hundreds of times in the pulpit. I've only seen tears roll down his cheeks one time outside the pulpit. <coughs> We're sitting in Johnson City, Tennessee, having a bite to eat. Dr. Rice's tears began to stream out of his corner of his eyes. <coughs> and I said, Brother Rice, what's wrong? <laughs> and Dr. Rice called a name, the name of a preacher with whom he had preached and whom he had loved for years. And he said, he turned on me. He turned on me. You'll never know. You'll never know <coughs> what it is to a preacher when his preacher boys turn on him. Fellows he's nurtured and taught and prayed down the aisle and ordained, laid his hands on them, prayed for them, maybe even performed their marriage ceremony <coughs> and have them turn and so Demas leaves. Paul picks up his pen. He begins to write. I think maybe he wrote <coughs> because... He had a preacher boy turn on him. By the way, that word forsake is worth, worth noting before we leave. <laughs> that word forsake, it's a Greek word, <coughs> which is the same word that was used by Jesus when he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And God turned his back on Jesus because he could not look upon sin. <coughs> that's the same word. It's the same word that's used in the Bible <coughs> about a mother who forsakes her own child to whom she has given birth, deserts a child. And Paul said, Demas has done to me what a mother would do to a deserted child, leaving a baby on the doorstep. <laughs> That's what Demas has done to me. He picks up his pen. <laughs> he begins to write Timothy. I think maybe he wanted to write one, another one of his preacher boys since one of his preacher boys had turned. And the Heavenly Father said to the Holy Spirit, Go down and record this. This is Holy Scripture. Paul writes, <coughs> Timothy, Come to see me. Come to see me, Timothy. He said, bring Mark with you when you come. <laughs> he said, Timothy, <coughs> I left a heavy overcoat. That Troas, it's called a cloak in the Bible. In the Greek, it means a very heavy overcoat. He said, when I was at <coughs> Troas, <coughs> I left a very heavy overcoat. He said, bring it when you come. And he said, Timothy, come before winter. <laughs> it's cold here. Winter time is coming, <coughs> and I need the overcoat. Then he said, Timothy, bring the books. Bring the books. Oh, that's a vital script, a statement. Bring the books. Everybody Christian ought to say, bring the books. <coughs> bring the books. Bring the books. Read. Oh, if I could give one thing to God's people. Read. Uh, one thing, reading is so much more creative than television. When I read <coughs> about <coughs> Little Red Riding Hood, <coughs> she's going to see her grandmother. <coughs> And a wolf came out and said, Good morning, little Red Riding Hood. I got that wolf pictured. I know what kind of tree it was right there beside the wolf. I know how big little Red Riding Hood was. You, you think she was skinny. I know she's fat. I know the original Greek. And uh, <laughs> I uh, think she's fat. I got it all pictured. When I read a book, I am my own production manager. Hey, you know all those little things you see after a program, you know, <coughs> the newscast said, uh, uh, cameraman, so and so and so and so, <coughs> and, uh, and writer of the script, so and so and so and so, and the fellow holds up the deal that does like this, and, uh, uh gives his name, <coughs> and the uh, audio gives his name, and video, <coughs> George Video gives his name, and uh, the wife who's at home 
praying for the guy who is the audio fella, gives her name. Uh, when I read a book, I'm all those guys. I'm all of them. When you finish your book, when I read it, <coughs> uh, then just say production manager, Jack Hiles. Director, Jack Hiles. Audio, Jack Hiles. Video, Jack Hiles. Producer, Jack Hiles. Yeah. Read. 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 Read books about the Bible. <laughs> read books about God. Read biographies of great men. Bring the books, he said. And then he said, especially the parchment. Now, I think <laughs> when he said the parchment, maybe, probably, he was saying, bring me something to write on. I've got some writing I want to do. I need some stationery. Bring me the parchments especially. And then he said, my departure is at hand. <laughs> what that means? That word departure is a, na a nautical term. It's a, a seagoing term. It means I'm about to pull anchor. <laughs> I like that. Paul said, I'm about to go to heaven. I'm about to pull anchor. He said, this old heavy anchor has been keeping me here. been wanting to go all the time. He said in Philippians chapter 1, he said, I, he said, I have a desire to depart, which is far better. Paul said, I'm about to pull anchor, Timothy. I'm about to leave and go to heaven now. And then he said, I fought the good fight. However, that term, fought the good fight, is a wider term than it appears to be. It implies all of the athletic contest. It means I fought the good fight. <laughs> I've run a good race. <laughs> I've wrestled a good match. I've jumped a good jump. I've hur uh, hurled a good javelin. I've lifted heavy weights. It's all of the athletic terms. I've shot a good basket. I've thrown a good pass. Made a good tackle. I've uh, hit a good ball. Caught a good ball. Thrown a good pitch. It's all of those wrapped up. All the Olympic games wrapped up. I've fought a good fight. And once in a while somebody says, well, <laughs> I'd like old Hiles, but he's always fighting. But Paul didn't say I've knitted a good sweater. <coughs> He didn't say, I've mimographed a good bulletin. The only thing a lot of preachers are going to have to show God when they get to heaven is mimograph ink. I fought a good fight. He said, I've wrestled. I've run. I've boxed. I've tackled. I've blocked. I've jumped. I've gone over hurdles. And then he said, I finished the course. He said, <laughs> every phase of the decathlon was over. <laughs> as God had planned, I did all that God planned I'd do. And then he said, as I did, I held on to the faith. I kept the faith. And then he said, I'm going to go to the Bema now, the winner's circle, and get my wreath and get my gold medal. And then he said, Timothy, Demas, hath forsaken you. Don't leave me now. What were his sins? <laughs> the first sin, he went home. <clears throat> Second sin, he forsook the old preacher. I promised God when I was 21 years of age, <clears throat> I'd stand beside the old preachers. I started having men 80 and 85 years of age and, and 90 almost in my pulpit. I had the old preachers in. I always took good offerings for them, tried to help them, tried to encourage them. And I've tried to keep that vow through the years, to stand beside the old preachers. Now I'm beside myself. What other sin did Demas commit? <laughs> Went home. What else? Forsook his old preacher. What else? Forsook the man of God. God's men aren't perfect. <laughs> God's men aren't always right. But I've decided when I do not know the issues involved, I'm going to stand for God's men. And I'll be right more than I'll be wrong. I've been wrong sometimes. And God's men have disappointed. <laughs> but I've always stood for God's men. And when I hear something about God's men, I don't believe it. Two of the finest preachers in America told me, <laughs> said, did you hear what happened to what so-and-so did? And they called one of the favorite preachers that comes to this church. And I, I said to both of them, you ought to be ashamed of yourselves. Don't you ever tell anybody stuff like that. That's garbage. He wouldn't do that. And I won't believe it unless I see it. Or unless he tells me he did it. Brother, <laughs> I stand beside the men of God. And then what other sin did he commit? He forsook the fellow who won him to Jesus. He forsook the one who won him to Jesus. I want to say this. I've been thinking about it an awful lot lately. There are twice in everybody's life. If you're saved at a young age, <coughs> there are twice <coughs> when, you when you have to re-enlist. Now listen carefully. When you have to re-enlist in the army of the Lord. <coughs> twice. <coughs> one is when you finish high school. Sometime in the late teens, <coughs> or in the late teens, sometime you have to 
shift the faith you've been taught to the faith that you believe. When I was in college, a freshman in college, I began to doubt this Bible. I sat at the feet of men who, who laughed at this book. I sat at the feet of brilliant men, they thought, and I thought, and the world thought, psycholo uh, psychology teachers and philosophy teachers. And they made fun of this Bible. And I, like everybody else that sits in the feet of those men, began to doubt it. You can't walk in the counts of the ungodly <laughs> and, and not be affected. You, can't, you may fall in the sewer and not drown, but you're going to stink when you get out. You, somebody said, you may fight a polecat and win the fight, but you'll never be like you were before you fought him. <clears throat> I was driving down the street one day in Texas and saw one of these little <coughs> black and white kittens went out in front of the car. <coughs> tried to swerve, tried to miss him, <coughs> couldn't hit him. Everywhere I went. Everywhere I went, I carried that stigma. Everywhere I went. I mean, what's that? Wow. Do you know, I bathed, <laughs> I showered, <laughs> I used steel wool, <coughs> I used Chanel number no. 5, Chanel number no. 6, Chanel number no. 10, Chanel number no. 20. Bathed in it. Sprayed it. Everybody say, Woo, what's that smell? <coughs> yeah. Our young folks go off to these state schools. They always come back. Woo, what's that smell? I say. What's that smell? When I was in school, freshman, I decided <coughs> that I was going <coughs> to read this book. I got on my knees and read every, every word of it on my knees. Read the Bible through <coughs> in about six months period on my knees. And I said, I'm going to find out if I believe it's the Word of God. And I got off my knees convinced that this book is the divine, eternal, inerrant, verbally inspired Word of God. But there's another time in a person's life. You know, we lose more people. All churches do. After high school graduation. But there's another time that comes about 20 years later. 20 to 25. When a person comes to, usually it's when he's middle age, he wants to, and his children are teenagers. <laughs> He's about to, to come into another era of his life. He's getting what he thinks old. He's losing his hair. And what he's losing on top, he's gaining in the middle. And uh, stomach gets big. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the five Bs, what, baldness and bifocals and bridges and bulges and bunions and, and so forth. And so he, uh, he uh, <laughs> gets all of that. <laughs> and, then he, uh, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> he wants to reclaim his youth. He may want to quit his job and go into business for himself. Now, always, that isn't wrong, but many times <laughs> it's a sad mistake. He wants a new house. He's 40 years old now. He, is, he wants to get him a 20-year-old woman. He wants to go to a new church. He wants to start over again. Old church is getting big now. He wants to start over again. And he goes through a crisis time in his life. A crisis time. Uh, don't laugh unless I'm being funny. If I'm being serious, I don't want to sit there laughing. And what happens? <laughs> He's got to reposition himself once again. Now, we've got to get ready for that. It happens to every, almost every single child of God. Paul is writing. And as he's writing... Here's steps. All of a sudden he thinks he'll not see Timothy again. <laughs> he'll not get that heavy cold. He won't be there till winter. They take him and lead him away. A little bug-eyed Jew Squeaky voice and small of stature who's turned the whole known world upside down for God. And they take him toward the river just outside that little Mamertine prison. And they lay him down and raise the sharpened guillotine. A big sword-like thing that has connected on two ends and raised up and you put your head under it and let it go. 
And the word spreads around the Christian world. <coughs> Did you hear? Did you hear? Paul has gone to heaven. The church in Thessalonica meets. The pastor stands to speak. He says, folks, I have an announcement I don't want to make. The founder of this church <coughs> and its first pastor, the man who's been the best friend this church has ever had, Paul, the beloved apostle, we just got word that he's gone. A young man or older, older man, middle-aged man, sets out <laughs> in the audience. The words are like briars when he hears about Paul being taken. <laughs> the words are like a sword piercing his breast. A conscience of guilt fills his heart. His name is Demas. I was in Rochester, Michigan. <laughs> Checked in the hotel <laughs> there. And uh, <laughs> Red Lion or Red Fox or Red Buttons Hotel, I forget what it was. Red Brick. <laughs> I was reading the other day in a sports magazine or a sport page and somebody asked Julius Irvin, said, what's your, what's your uh, church preference? He said, Red Brick. That'll get to you after a while. And uh, anyway, I was in this red something hotel. <laughs> so uh, I checked in, and, and a lady looked at me. I was checking in, writing it down, and uh, I, I said uh, to, to the innkeeper, I said, my name is Jack Hiles. And a lady checking in beside me looked over, and she said, uh, see, I was in this movie, the movie called Burning Hell. And she looked. this lady looked at me as checking in, and she said, son, sit down. And she said, are you Dr. Jack Hiles? And I said, Yes, ma'am. She said, I saw you in the burning hell. <coughs> I said, no, ma'am. You got me mixed up with another Jack Hyle. Because <coughs> you'll never see me in the burning hell. I checked in the room. There's a notice to call Miss McKinney. And I called and she said, Dr. Bill Rice just died. I had no regrets. I raised the money for the pews at the Bill Rice Ranch. I was, I tried to be good to him, had no regrets. I, I missed him, still do. No one ever liked him. But I was his friend. I was in my study on a Saturday morning, <laughs> started to walk out <clears throat> to get the mail. Jim Vineyard walks down the hallway and says, did Dr. Ford Porter's son get in touch with you? I said, no. He said, they're trying to get in touch with you. They want you to preach the funeral for Dr. Ford Porter. I had no regrets. I tried to be good to him. I was in a motel in Wyoming, Rock Springs, Wyoming. I checked in the motel, went to my room. I said, call you, no, notes said, call your secretary. I had a flat well with these red lights. Oh, uh, and I called the office. and <laughs> They said, call Mrs. Irma McKinney. Area code 219-932-0711. I called Irma. She said, Brother Howes, Dr. Beecham Vic. His office just called and said he dropped dead with a heart attack suddenly, unexpectedly. I had no regrets. I was in bed a few days ago at 2 o'clock in the morning. Dr. Walt Hanford called and said, Dr. Rice just went to, to heaven. I stood beside him. I had no regrets. Demas hath forsaken me. The rest of his life, he was the God that forsook the apostle. The rest of his life, he was known as the God that didn't stand, that didn't stay. And as long as there's a Bible to be found and a New Testament to be read, Demas will be the one that turned back. You're about to turn back. Huh? Have you turned back some? Oh, you say, preacher, if I'd have been there, I had never, would never have left the Apostle Paul. You already have, some of you. He said, uh, 
Paul said, Touch not the unclean thing. You've already left him there, haven't you? Paul said, Be ye not unequal yoke together with unbelievers. You've already left him there, haven't you? Paul said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, that ye present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. You've already left him there, haven't you? The Bible has been, been written. It's all finished. And what you do will never be put down in the Bible. But as sure as those lights are in the ceiling, and as sure as this pulpit made out of wood, God is writing a record of your. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that you would bless the truth of this message to our hearts. Help us to realize that day, one day when Demas decided to improvise a story, has caused all the good that he ever did to be overshadowed with the cloud of forsaking God's man.